All right, so in last lecture, we were sharing screen. Okay. Yeah, so last lecture, we were talking a bit about these uh, plasma balls. And the reason why we were talking about them is because actually it's a important part of the photocopy machine. There's a, a part of the photocopy machine that uh, requires putting like electrons on the surface of this photoconductor. And then eventually actually it's used again to transfer the toner onto the piece of paper. So you need some way of kind of sprinkling elect electrons everywhere. And the best way to do this is by using uh, this so-called Corona wire. And basically what it does is, is it kind of generates uh, a plasma and the plasma is basically, you know, ionized air and um, it has uh, electrons uh, inside it. So as part of the plasma, because the plasma is sort of a soup of ions and electrons. So uh, this is basically, you know, uh, one example of how to, um, well, a more visual way to see, you know, what's happening in this sort of Corona wire and uh, a plasma ball is something that generates plasma, of course, and uh, basically in this region around the, uh, the central, central um, uh, contact in the middle here, uh, we have basically plasma that is uh, formed in the gas. And so we, we saw a couple of different experiments um, where you, know, these, uh, you see these uh, filaments um, uh, basically spread from the middle to, to these edges of, of the glass. And, and we saw this interesting effect where it can actually light a fluorescent tube. Um, so yeah, so we we're talking about how to actually make the plasma. Basically you need a high voltage. So in air you need a voltage per centimeter of about 30,000. So that means you got two plates, 30,000 volts. Uh, separated by one centimeter, or another way to think of it, as we saw, was uh, as an electric field. So, electric field uh, is basically the uh, you know sort of force per unit charge on a particle here. But you can also think of it as like volts per distance. And uh, and so basically, what this tells you is that you can either have uh, something which is thirty thousand volts and separated by this distance uh, that would make a spark or you, you could have a different shape and actually this would create a stronger electric field so in this case you actually might not need 30,000 volts and that's good because you know um, generally these are sort of appliances that you have maybe in the office or the house and uh, uh, you know the lower the voltage the well safer it is and uh, generally the easier thing to make so uh, in practice, the voltage, you don't have to have a 30,000 volt uh, wire inside the um, photocopy machine. Um, you saw a couple, uh, example of this, uh, another example of how this plasma can form, and this is in lightning rods. Um, in this case, uh, basically, you have this to guide any lightning strike to ground, but actually the, the pointy shape of it actually makes a very a uh, strong corona in certain circumstances. So um, actually I should get a more sort of real picture because it's sort of a drawing and maybe you can't believe it as easily as a photograph, but um, you uh, can actually sometimes see this, like if there's gonna be a lightning strike soon then from pointy objects, you can have this kind of glow that's uh, happening uh, around pieces of metal. So you might have some like a metal tower and then at the top you might actually see a corona glow and um, that's basically the same effect where electricity is actually causing the air around it to ionize and actually uh, make the gas glow well the air glow um, different colors because uh, different uh, atoms actually just naturally emit different colors um, as some of you correctly said, it was uh, basically because of the different energy of the light, different frequency, but that ultimately comes from basically the fact that different atoms have different energy level spacings. 
Um, and we'll look at this a little bit more later. Uh, we also kind of worked out how, uh, you know, why when you touch the side of the plasma ball, even though the glass is not conducting, um, it will actually conduct some, uh, well, it would, it would, the filaments will get attracted to it. And even though, you know, the glass doesn't conduct, like uh, it seems like, you know, it shouldn't make any difference in an AC circuit, um, actually, uh, you don't really need actually something in the middle to conduct. You can have a capacitor um, where there's no no contact here, right? So um, we we all built this circuit together, um, and I think what well I think if you built the circuit correctly, what you saw is that the electrons still actually oscillate, so they go back and forth like this, and that's despite the fact that this thing has uh, there's no this thing doesn't conduct electricity at all. This is like a capacitor. It's completely open, right? It doesn't conduct electricity, but still, you still have the current. And because you still have the current, uh, basically, when you form, when you touch the side of this, this will actually feel the effects. And then actually, uh, the, the corona filament will actually still be uh, attracted to your finger. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, okay, so that's just some graphs. Okay, so I think this is basically where we got up to, and then I think we were going through some uh, sort of puzzles like this where we saw um, if we touch the side of the uh, plasma ball, then we saw the filaments sort of uh, jump up and down. like that. It's, it would sort of go up, break, form again, go up, break. I repeat that cycle and we worked out that this was because of the heat that is generated in that filament okay so that's basically what we got up to just a bit of revision um now again you know normally we'd be doing a demo in class but uh it's just not possible so um you know the next demo that i would do at this point would be to use uh you know, show this uh, fluorescent light actually lighting. So, well, we can't do that. So let's just have another quick look at a, a video here. So um, uh, I already showed you this, but just as a kind of refresher. Oh, this thing is powerful. Look at this. Oops, sorry. Now let's do it in the dark. This is insane. Wow. Boom. That's so cool. Look how big it is. If I bring it closer, it's super much brighter. What if sorry, I touch? I think the I think the video is sorry. sorry my sh not sharing the right screen. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always forget. Okay, let's do that again. Okay. Except the button. Let's go up it all the way at the end. Let's see what happens. All the way at the end. Wow, this thing is powerful. Look at this. Now let's do it in the dark. This is insane. Wow. That's so cool. Look how big it is. If I bring it closer, it's super much brighter. What if I touch it? Oh, super bright. All right, guys, what do you think? Mm. Be careful if you... Yeah, so... So basically, you know, this uh, fluorescent tube, just the regular fluorescent tube you might have in a room or office, um, it's not connected to any electricity. Uh, obviously, this plasma ball is connected to electricity. That's why it's uh, doing all these things. Um, so, uh, you know, it seems magical, right? Like you can actually, uh, actually light up a, a, a light without even connecting it to electricity, right? So let's try and figure out, you know, why or exactly how this is happening. Um, what do you guys think? What 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 do you think is uh, making this thing glow? Any ideas? 
No. Okay. Uh, well, let's break it down a little bit then. So, uh, you know, let's just think about what normally happens in a fluorescent light. Actually, we're going to do this a bit later. So perhaps it's uh, not really, um, you know, uh, surprising. So this is a bit puzzling. But uh, in a normal um, fluorescent light, what actually happens is that, um, uh, well, let me just sort of draw it on here. So on on the on the coat on the this glass is actually coated with some. Um, it's not very good drawing, but uh, there there's some coating on the inside of this, which is some kind of. This is uh, where the, it gets the name fluorescent. Um, there's some kind of fluorescent uh, sort of paint that's on the inside of it. And basically the, um, the, the reason why we have that fluorescent paint is because inside the tube, we have actually a gas of um, like mercury. There's some small amount of mercury inside these tubes. And if you sort of heat it up a little bit, well, even room temperature, um, it uh, there will be some amount of gas, which is uh, mercury. And just like how we can have, uh, you know, just it basically works more or less the same way as, as these lamps. So, okay, I mean, actually, so we do have mercury here, but um, I think actually it's not the main wavelength that it emits, there's actually more uh, wavelength that it emits in the ultraviolet regime. And then the ultraviolet light is actually kind of converted to um, like more visible white light. Okay, so um, so basically, you know, this fluorescent tube works you know, roughly in the same way as as these tubes. You put a you put a voltage across this gas, and then this gas kind of lights up and um, and emits emits uh, some. Uh, some um, you know some light okay so that you know you can for now maybe just think of this thing uh, basically as the same same thing as like one of these neon lights uh, it's just it works in a slightly different way um, okay but you know maybe what's a little bit more interesting in what we what we're talking about here is not so much like how you know what uh, what gas there is in here or anything like that but but you know, how does the electricity basically get here in, in, in the first place, right? Like, because normally you connect this to some voltage, right? And then um, then there will be some electricity that will be sort of passed through the gas, and then and then that's that's basically how the electricity is uh, getting here. But I mean, in this case, like, where is the electricity flowing from? Does anybody have any idea? No idea. Oh, somebody will say something. No. Okay. Um, well, let's go back and think about like uh, how we, you know, uh, how this this situation happened. Like when you touch the side of the ball, basically what was happening is that you have this high voltage um sort of metal cylinder here and then because of the high voltage it uh it, it tends to sort of ionize this gas and you know the process of that ionization works something like this basically you have this high high voltage negative terminal so emitting some electrons and then it's uh you know bouncing off the uh you know gas molecules that are actually in here and then when it collides with the gas molecules it emits more electrons and then basically there's this cascade effect where all these electrons um, and uh, ionized atoms are actually present in here 
and basically this is what is uh, happening in this um, you know, inside this filament. So this filament here, what we're seeing here, uh, actually a whole bunch of um, electrons and ionized uh, atoms, which are present, uh, that's like kind of forming this sort of connection um, inside the space. Like where it's not glowing is just like regular gas. So uh, you have this plasma forming just uh, on this uh, on these filaments. Okay. And then, so basically, maybe the way to think of this is that when this uh, filament here forms, I mean, it's actually kind of like a wire, right? Because over here, it's actually somewhat conducting, right? It's, it's electrons and ions and stuff like that. And so you have this high voltage source here, and basically you have now a wire going to the surface here. Now the glass doesn't conduct anything, right? But uh, the thing is, is that just like with the uh, with with you know the finger example, um, uh, instead of having a finger, you actually have another another gas um, inside here, which is going to be the the mercury mercury gas. Okay, and this mercury gas also can actually um, ionize, and that can actually also form a uh, you know, a kind of a, a plasma inside this tube. And so once, uh, you know, the electric field here is kind of strong enough, such that this can actually form a plasma inside uh, this tube as well, because, you know, basically, you know, this is now sort of an extension of the, the gas here. Okay, so this is like some different gas, this is argon, and this is like uh, mercury, but actually, uh, you know, because this is an AC, this is an AC circuit, um, doesn't actually matter that there's this connection here inside is broken, as we saw uh, when we did this RC circuit, right? Because it does, you know, it didn't, it didn't really matter so much that basically there's the connection here is broken. AC actually just keeps on, can keep on um, kind of working, even though there is, a, you know, a connection or a gap in the middle. So uh, basically here, there's, there's no real electrical connection, but then the electrons and ions inside here are oscillating really fast here, right? And that's, that's kind of producing uh, an electric field, which the gas, is, um, the gas inside this is you know, only just a few millimeters away. So it can actually feel the electric field here. And then if these ionize, then you'll actually get a full connection basically from uh, basically the circuit starts to look a lot like this it's except you know the difference here is that instead of having uh just the person we've also got the fluorescent tube in the middle and actually if you remember when this guy actually um uh did the uh, experiment at the beginning he was saying he was saying stuff like um what, what am i sharing here It's saying, well, this is like a freaking sword. <laughs> An interesting thing, it turns off right next to my hand. Hmm, let's grab it shorter. You see, it turns off next to my hand. Uh, let's turn the hmm. light. So, off. actually, you know, it turns off actually near his hand, right? Um, can someone? explain like why it might just turn off right near his hand you mean when the light is far away from the plasma ball mm -hmm. Um, I think it's because the electrical field gets weaker when it's far away and uh, um, the molecules in the tube, I don't know how to call that, is that light or light, light tube? Oh, mm, the, fluorescent light, yeah. Far, yeah, right, right. Um, the air molecules in it doesn't um, ionize. Right, so, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, keep so going. There, so the light would not like, I guess it's just because if there's no electricity 
Mm. Yes, mm. yes. So exactly, yes. So um, basically, when you <clears throat> if the tube is a bit further away, <clears throat> then um, you know basically what the uh, fluorescent tube over here is actually feeling. It's it's actually really feeling the you know uh, oscillating electric field that's actually in here, right? So this this filament here is actually a plasma, and then these things are all oscillating kind of back and forth like really fast. Now you know the the electric field you know around here, um, it can feel uh, you know the the atoms inside the tube can feel it, but of course if it's further away, then you know it feels it feels it less. So yeah, so that's right, absolutely correct, Vale. So well done. Um, and uh but actually so what i was uh uh also asking is so remember so this guy is saying that um when you when you have uh, when you hold the fluorescent tube uh shorter right so let me sorry uh and share the right screen again yeah so when you hold the when you hold the tube a bit shorter, so where is it? Uh, sorry, close this. Yeah, so see, notice here, he's holding it here, right? And then basically over here, like um, like further away from the tube, uh, it's no longer glowing, right? So it only glows up to the point where he's holding, holding the tube. So if he, if he holds it a bit shorter, like here, uh, then it only glows up until that point. So can somebody try to explain that one? No idea. Is it because the electricity flows over through the hand? Hmm. Yes. Yes. I. I believe that's right. That's so. That's. Uh, uh, that's the explanation I would give. So yes, I think that's that's correct. And so uh, when you uh, let me just go back to my slides here. Yeah. So basically, you know, what's happening here is that um, it's basically the same circuit as we've got here. It's just that when uh, you've got the fluorescent tube, you've got that also in the middle. So basically, you've got the high voltage thing in the, in the, in the center here. Uh, you've got the plasma forming these filaments. It's the glass globe. Then you put the, like the fluorescent tube. And when you put the fluorescent tube there, um then you know imagine you've got the tube here like like so Let, let's just shorten his hand so okay so let's say his hand is now like this okay so basically through the tube there will be a similar sort of plasma okay so the inside here the gas will now ionize and that will also form a kind of a connection and be forming a wire and then the rest of the circuit is completed by him holding uh, the tube. And again, you know, the, the tube is made of glass, but um, in AC, it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much, actually, that the tube is connected by glass. So it will, uh, you know, the AC current will actually flow through him, actually, and then go, go to ground. And uh, that basically completes the, the full circuit. So, um, so, yeah, so that's basically, you know, uh, what's happening when you put the fluorescent light uh, near the tube. I hope that sort of answers most of it. Um, more details of, you know, like what's actually in the tube and stuff like that, we will talk a little bit more about that uh, a bit later, but um, just think of it more or less the same as neon light. Okay, so that's that one. Now, <clears throat> 
another one. I couldn't really find a video of this one, but if you actually put a uh, coin on near the sides of this, then uh, it will actually attract the coin, like not really strong, but um, it'll actually be slightly attracted to the side of it. This is supposed to be a piece of string. And <clears throat> um, uh, does anybody have an idea of uh, why it might get attracted? Is it because of the induced electricity? Oh, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, great. Yes. So, um, yeah, exactly. So, even though there's no actual electrical connection here, um, you know, there is an electric field which is going through the glass. And just like with the induced charges that we were talking about earlier uh, in the slide set, basically, this will also induce some, you know, uh, charges that are actually inside this piece of metal because the metal conducts electricity very well. And basically that will uh, form a kind of a charge distribution such as to kind of uh, attract to the, um, to, the, to, the, to the filament that's actually inside here. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, that's uh, I think pretty much it for the plasma ball. So let's go back to the photocopy machine um, example. And so uh, just I just want to show you actually what this corona wire thing actually looks like because um, you know, it just looks a little bit abstract in these diagrams. So let me let me just show you a video that I found of, of the actual corona wire itself. So the corona wire is to place the initial charge on the drum. The defects related to a dirty or defective corona wire, the white or black vertical streaks, always in the same position, or completely black or white pages. Sometimes leaving the corona wire does not solve the problem. To change the corona wire is not removing the corona assembly from the drum unit. The corona assembly contains the corona wire. Remove the grid and all other covers if present. Mm. There are various yeah. types of corona assembly. So <clears throat> that's just quickly just to show you what it really looks like. So you know, basically, it's just it's just a piece of wire, and um, uh, it's uh, you know it's just stretched across, and it's you know about the size width of a of a piece of you know A4 paper because uh, A4 paper would be going through the photocopy machine. Um, okay, so. I think that's all I really wanted to say for that one. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, I think, yeah. And that this, uh, oh, am I sharing the right screen? Okay, and uh, I think this uh, metal shield here is basically there to kind of um, you know, uh, put the, reflect all the electrons that are going sort of so it's going all in the right direction. Okay. Um, yes. And so, uh, yeah. So, so when you have this uh, corona wire, so in this case, uh, you know, actually the photoconductor looks uh, like this drum. And, um, and so basically how, uh, how this will actually work in the end is that, um, so here, this is the corona wire that is actually uh, applying all the charges uh, to the drum in the first place. And so this is like rotating. And so the image actually is imprinted in terms of the charges. And remember, so this is a photoconductor so that when you, imprint the image, then all the, you know, dark bits, uh, all the dark bits will have the charges and all the light bits will not have charges, right? So basically what will 
happen is that at this point, after it passes through this point, it will have kind of the image um, on, on, on this drum, like in terms of the charges. And then, so this is what they call the, the latent image because actually it's uh, in terms of charges, right? Then <clears throat> this is the toner, which is now applied and this gets attracted to all the positive charges. Um, and basically it's just, you know, black particles that have uh, you know, charged. Um, and right, and also when you make, when you put this image on, Basically, you are putting the image on sort of like, you can imagine maybe strip by strip on the page, right? So you've got this A4, A4 paper, and you know how in a photocopy machine, it scans, scans the paper, like, you know, there's a bright light that goes, uh, scans across the page. And so basically what that bright light is doing is it's kind of reading off the, you know, image on the paper uh, at, at, at any given sort of line in the paper, right? And that line uh, that is read off of the photocopy machine is actually imprinted onto the, onto the drum, sort of, you know, sort of line by line, if you like. I mean, actually it's sort of continuous, but uh, it helps to just think of it line by line. Okay, and then here you've got the toner and then here comes the paper. The paper just sort of rolls through. Um, there's another corona wire here, which, uh, is to basically get the toner off the drum and onto the onto the paper. So at this point, basically the the uh, paper is sort of charged up, right? And because the toner, you know, sometimes the toner doesn't quite come off. I think this is just to scrape off the residual toner. Um, and then over here, this is actually to remove this um, extra charge, so that you know all the charges are clean as well. That's basically the full cycle. Um, oh, and then yes, and then the toner, pa paper with the toner comes along here, and then it basically fuses. This is just some heat rollers, right? So it's just some rollers that are, you know, uh, heated up, and the heat actually kind of um, presses it onto the paper so it doesn't like just fall off of it. Okay, so. So that's basically, you know, how how the photocopy machine works. Um, uh, right, uh, can't quite remember why I wanted to talk about this one. Um, uh, so why do we have the opposite charge on the drum? I, I think it's yeah. So. Um, Actually, we, it's not really present in this picture at all, but um, um, hmm. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we don't have to worry so much about this slide. So let's, let's forget about it. Um, and just uh, laser printers. I mean, this is actually a little bit probably more familiar to you, but actually laser printers work in pretty much the same way. So. Um, the only difference between laser printers and photocopy machines uh, is, uh, you know, the way that they print is pretty much the same. But um, instead of actually, uh, so in the you know old-fashioned photocopy machines, like this light, which is uh, kind of reading off the the page that you're trying to photocopy, right? That light itself is actually used you know, kind of focused onto the drum. And that actually produces this pattern of charges, which is what they're calling latent image here. Now, uh, in a laser print, it's, it's kind of the same thing, but I mean, instead of using just like the light, which is bounced off the piece of paper, uh, you digitally like first read off, uh, you know, pixel by pixel, the you know, the page, right? So you basically kind of scan the document first. And then once you've got the scan of the document, then you can just shine a laser such as to create the same image by shining a laser and then, um, you know, turning on and off the laser very fast so that it kind of just uh, prints out uh, in light um, this. And so this, this drum here is basically the same thing as this uh, photoconductor drum that you have here. And uh, the only difference here is how you actually, uh, you know, 
uh, get the light with the image information on it um, onto the drum. And otherwise, it basically works in the same way. So, so laser printers, photocopy machines are um, more or less, you know, very, very similar. Actually, it's just uh, a question of how how the um, uh, you know where the image is actually coming from. So we can just have a quick look at this video, which will show you come to sort of uh, show you how this is actually produced. Hold on. To fully understand how technically complex color printing is, take a look at the electrophotographic process. The primary charge roller, or PCR, rotates next to the OPC drum and applies a negative charge to the surface of the OPC drum, which prepares it for the imaging process. The OPC drum is then exposed to a laser, which forms the image. This area is more positively charged than the areas not exposed to the laser. Stirred in the hopper. The toner adder roller collects the toner, moving it to the surface of the developer roller. The doctor blade then levels it to the precise height. As toner moves from component to component, it develops a negative charge, which is attracted to the more positively charged image on the OPC drum. OPC must be something like photoconductor, so I don't know the what it's transferred. The toner on the OPC drum is then transferred to the paper. This process occurs within the four color cartridges in every laser printer. The paper with the toner then passes through the fusing assembly, where it is melted and fused to the paper. Any toner remaining on the OPC drum is cleaned and moved to the waste bin by the wiper blade. The latent image on the OPC drum surface is erased by the PCR. Excess toner not transferred to the OPC drum is scrubbed from the developer roller surface by the toner adder roller and returned to the toner hopper. All right. I think that's it. Um, so yeah, okay. So that was a color printer actually, but basically in a color printer, it's not so different. It's uh, just that you know you use uh, you know more than just black and white in order to get your image. Um, you know you use maybe uh, four colors I think to, uh, to to generate the full color spectrum. Okay, I think uh, yeah. So this is just to explain the same thing. Um, so yes, so instead of instead of uh, the image actually being read off from the light, it's actually kind of stored already digitally, and then the laser is actually uh, directed at various points, and then it just sort of scans across so that to produce the image. Okay. okay um, any questions about this? I think this is the last slide of uh, this this set, but I hope. Uh, you actually now appreciate a little bit of how um, this kind of technology works. Um, you know, in a photocopy machine, you know, it's actually all kinds of uh, different technologies that are sort of coming together. You need to understand sort of static electricity, um, and in order to uh, you know, generate like the static electricity, you need to actually um, you know, understand a few things like, you know, plasmas and, um, you know, all these kinds of things. So, um, so I hope you appreciate all that. Um, any, any questions that anybody has? No. Okay. Well, let's just go back and let's see if we can uh actually i understand some of these questions that i had um right at the beginning so 
All right. Uh, well, this one is a little bit, first one is a little bit too generic, but um, uh, maybe we can um, slightly shorten the question. So, um, oh, sorry, there's something in the chat. How does the printer control color? Oh, yes, right. Um, so, uh, so as, as that video just explained, there's like, I think there's four, four different drums, right? And basically by, uh, you know, uh, repeating the process. Um, so, you know, I, uh, you know, maybe it's like cyan, magenta, and yellow, and um, I, get, I get the fourth one. But anyway, so I think there's like four colors you can combine and, and, and basically make any, uh, color image that you want, right? So when you uh, have the color uh, printer, I think what it needs to do is it needs to sort of separate out like these four four colors, right? So the basically there will be four, um, you know, four kind of photoconducting drums, and it will go through kind of in sequence uh, of uh, like printing, say the the red part of it, the cyan part of it, magenta part of it, yellow part, of it, you know, and then it just goes through, and then by adding you know these layers on top of each other, it will eventually reproduce the same color. So the uh, original image that you have, I think, first needs to be kind of decomposed into these uh, different colors that are eventually printed, and basically when when it prints it, sort of does it. You know on top of each other so there's like you know different colors and by basically combining it uh you know you, you'll get the uh, different colors so yeah oh and okay so maybe your question was how does it control it well i guess there's a um you know the degree of the of the charges so you know uh, i guess the way that i explained it is that you know it's either black or white right so in that case it seems like it's um you know, zero 100 percent but i mean obviously you can probably also uh change the degree of the amount of charge right on 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 the drum by applying light of different intensities so the, the brighter light that you apply you know completely depletes the charge on the on the photoconductor right so uh but then if your you know color is only 50 sorry if your light is only 50 percent then it might not um deplete all the charge it will deplete only you know some part of the charge and then you'll get correspondingly a different degree of the toner on here because it will attract less toner if it's only 50 percent charge on it then it'll only uh have 50 percent toner and um so I, I think that that's basically how it's controlling the color and um yeah. okay so thanks for the question um so let's try and just go through to make sure we actually can answer all these questions because that's basically what we were starting out with. Um, so maybe can somebody explain, um, you know, what is the, uh, you know, what is the main component of the photocopier um, and, and how does it actually work? Does somebody want to give, it, give that a try? Well, I can try. Okay. Um, so the main components may uh, include the corona wire, the, um, the, the how do you say that? Photo, photo conductor, drum and the toner, mm. uh, also the, the image, right? Mm. Um, and there is the fuser at the very end. Right, yep. So okay. how it actually works is that, and you first um, kind of initialize the, the photo conductor with one side with electrons and the other side with the positive charges. And then you cover but, but in the uh, actual photo copy machine, you use the reflection. Um, 
kind of you neutralize the part that uh, in the image are um, empty or just white, and then the other side that in the image is like um, colorful or has something on it, you um, like maintain those electrons on this place. And then you apply the toners on it so that um, with the toners, you can, uh, the toner will be placed on the spots on the paper. Uh, I didn't say it clearly, but uh, just the toner will stay the place where the image is covered, the, those positions that image lies on. And then you, uh, right at the very end, you, you heat it and uh, uh, you put the paper on it and then the toner will be um, applied to the paper and then you heat it so that it fu fu it's fused onto the paper. Great, yes, brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Bail. Uh, that's a perfect explanation, yep. All right, so exactly. And so yes, the main component Possibly, yes, this is the most important component, the photoconductor, right? Because this is the thing that allows you to control the, where the um, uh, electrons are. And then, and then uh, yeah, that allows you to uh, put the toner in the, in the right position. Great, okay, so, um, so does anybody wanna give this a try for this question? So, so what is the bright band of light actually um actually doing why do we have that bright band of light in the photocopy machine owen you want to give it a try Not there. Okay, Owen's not there. All right, how about somebody else? Uh, how about Ching Chen? Hmm. Either very shy or also not there. Shame. Ella? Uh, I'm here. Uh, I think uh, the bright band of light. Uh, I think this is just, just for scanning and uh, to, uh, to, to, is, it, is that for charging? Yes. Uh, it is for uh, charging and uh, to uh, help the toner to get the uh, positive charges onto the um, the the photoconductor. Mm. Yes. Um, yes. Well, eventually, yes. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Ella. Um, yeah. So basically, you know, the light is indeed it's scanning the, the piece of paper, and you know. Uh, if, if it's dark on the piece of paper, the light doesn't reflect as much, right? And then so the light, uh, eventually that image of the light uh, that is reading off the piece of paper is kind of applied to this photoconductor. And then that image is causing the charges to distribute itself according to the image of the, um, uh, that's already on the piece of paper. So basically we're trying to, convert the image on the piece of paper into an same image of the of the charges on the um on the photo okay that's good um and well last question is very similar in the end so the laser instead of uh scanning it it's actually uh just directly applying the light to the photoconductive drum and then, um, and basically toner is just some black stuff that uh, eventually you can fuse to a piece of paper, but it's uh, kind of charged so that it's attracted to the photoconductor. Okay, so uh, just a bit of a sort of a 
summary of uh, what we've done. So I think that's all we have for this slide set. So I think we can move on uh, if nobody has any other questions. If not, so uh, let's, whoops. Uh, let me just open up my next slide set. Okay. All right. So uh, next topic is electromagnetic waves. So uh, electromagnetic waves is actually, you know, it's basically light, but light, light is usually what we call um, electromagnetic waves that we can see with our own eyes. But actually, that's just a very small spectrum. And we can actually, there are actually electromagnetic waves that are, uh, you know, any going anything from radio waves to um, X rays, ultraviolet, uh, and, and and so forth. So basically, we, we're going to try and understand what these are, and the the, the sort of the uh, practical aim of what we're going to try and understand are. Um, well, mobile phones. And so, of course, mobile phones are a critical part of our lives these days. And we're going to try and understand, well, from a physics perspective, basically, you know, how, how mobile phones really can transfer information. And, um, you know, if you think about it, you know, we went from uh, mobile phones, which was something just to, you know, make phone calls with i mean these days actually almost nobody makes phone calls with phones which is uh ironic in a way uh and everybody uses them really more for um transmission of information now you know i mean these days the amount of information that people are transferring is uh enormous right even with phones it used to be that um you know early days of the internet um, you know, I remember back in the back in the '90s and early 2000s when trying to um, you know connect to the internet, like one megabyte would be you know quite a big thing to be transferring over the internet, right? So that um, of course uh, you know one megabyte is like nothing now, right? You can transfer it in a second. So uh, and you know even with your phone, so you know. What, what is the sort of technology that allows so much information to be, to be transferred? Um, and uh, of course, you know, uh, you would know about, um, you, know, five, you know, 4G, 5G technology uh, in phones, but you know, what, what actually is this 4G and 5G? We, you, know, you know, it's some kind of advanced way of um, uh, you know, communicating with your phones, but uh, exactly, you know what what actually is it really so these some some kind of questions that we'll be looking at okay so let's get let's start from the basics right so we were doing you know static electricity but um uh kind of very analogous type of thing is uh magnetism right and I'm sure you, you know, more or less familiar with uh, magnetism to some extent. So, um, you know, magnetism is uh, the simplest example is, of course, just some kind of uh, magnet. So if you've got your magnets on your fridge, then, um, you know, what this is actually made of are uh, individual atoms, which are actually, you can kind of consider them to be small small magnets and basically depending on whether they are all aligned in the, in the same direction or not basically determines uh, whether it's a magnet or not. Um, now you might think well okay if you just say magnet is a bunch of small magnets and you know it doesn't really tell me still what a magnet is. Well you know ultimately uh, you know you have to start to look at the kind of you know property 
at the sort of atomic level. And, you know, at some point, actually, this sort of becomes sort of a fundamental kind of property of an atom. So um, uh, sometimes you can understand magnetism of, uh, of an atom because basically you can kind of picture the atom to have electrons which are orbiting, right? And then what we're going to see is that if you have a, like a current that's going in a, in a loop, then that can be thought of as a magnet. But actually, um, some materials are not necessarily even like that. They just uh, possess a magnetic, uh, magne magnetic property. Um, and in physics, you call it uh, spin. But uh, at some point, it's actually uh, you know, hard to really explain beyond what that is, is uh, you know, that, that it just has this magnetic property. Um, and so actually it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a tricky one to explain because, um, uh, you know, okay, so a, mag a big magnet is just a bunch of small magnets, but then, okay, so what is a small magnet? But, you know, at some point you reach kind of the bottom and um, there's nowhere really else to go. Uh, but, um, but, okay, I mean, maybe we can uh, try and keep, uh, keep that question in the back of our minds and, um, and keep going. But you know, for now, I'm just going to say that uh, a magnet is, you know, consists of uh, atoms, which are all individually small magnets. And then, but then, you know, they might be all pointing in the same direction. Okay. So um, there are different types of magnetic materials. Um, now, uh, the thing that you know we most commonly uh, call magnets are actually what we call our ferromagnets, and um, these things have uh, well these three types of categories of magnets have slightly different properties, um, depending upon uh, you know basically what these uh, underlying atoms kind of want to do. Okay, so in a ferromagnet. Uh, basically, the small magnets, or actually, so in physics, we'd normally call it the spin. Um, and uh, spin, you, you can just, I guess, think of it as the same as the small magnet. So in a ferromagnet, basically, what the atoms that make up the ferromagnet want to do is that they all want to point the same direction. Um, now, they... They don't really care overall which direction they face. Okay, so in a ferromagnet, uh, they could equally. Okay, I should put my hand this way. So imagine my fingers are the uh, ferromagnet. Now, ferromagnets equ are equally happy if they point this way or this way or this way or you know or any way, right? Uh, so long that they all point all together in the same direction, they're happy. Okay, now. Basically, so if like one is pointing this way, then uh, this is an unhappy ferromagnet. All right, so you know, ferromagnets all want to point the same way. Okay. Um, so this is why, for example, if you have this is an external magnetic field, say you bring another magnet in. Basically, in a ferromagnet, uh, the, the primary thing that they want to do is point in the same direction. But because it doesn't really matter which way they overall point, for example, with no applied field, it would uh, point just in some random direction. It doesn't really matter. But then if there is some applied field from the outside, then it will want to point in the same direction because uh, that way they all point in the same direction and they all follow the field of the outside magnet, right? So this is a little bit like how a compass works, right? So a compass is like, you know, a little magnet which is balanced delicately. And then because uh, the Earth has a magnetic field, it will point in the same direction. So that's basically the situation of ferromagnet. Now, what are these other things? Well, a paramagnet is basically, it doesn't have this property where they uh, all want to point in the same direction. So they're equally happy to just to sort of point in random directions like you know some random random arrangement like this um but uh so they don't really have this uh thing where they want to point in the same direction 
But if there's a, an external field applied, then they want to point in that direction that, uh, you know, of the external, external magnet. So basically without the, without the external field, it will just point in random directions. But then with the external field, all of a sudden they'll all point in the, in the same direction. And this is actually a little bit like the metal in your fridge, right? So the metal in your fridge, well, I'm sorry, the, the fridge, what the fridge is made of. The metal that your fridge is made of, it doesn't really, uh, it's not magnetic when you don't do anything. But then when you bring your fridge magnet onto the fridge, now all of a sudden it sticks to, the magnet sticks to the metal, right? And it sticks to the metal basically because uh, the, 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 the magnet, the fridge magnet is actually one of these ones, it's ferromagnetic. But then the fridge itself is just a paramagnetic, okay? And then you bring the fridge magnet near the, um, near the fridge, then basically the uh, atoms inside the fridge now all of a sudden all point in the same direction. And then now, because you've got the paramagnet near the paramagnet, now they'll actually stick to each other because um, basically if you bring, uh, you know, you bring, um, you know, this thing here, say, you know, closer to these guys over here, then this produces a, a magnetic field that's like this way. And then now these atoms, these paramagnet, paramagnetic atoms will also want to point overall in this way. And now you've basically got two magnets. It's like, uh, this is like north, south, and then this is north, um, south and then they'll get attracted to each other okay. so when you put a magnet on a fridge it's basically like a ferromagnet and a paramagnet paramagnet together now a uh, diamagnet which is uh, we're not really going to look at this very much but uh, basically this is like the um sort of the opposite case of the um this paramagnetic case so in this uh in the paramagnetic case, basically it wants to point in the same direction as the field. Now in the diamagnetic case, it actually wants to point in the opposite direction. Okay, so the field is actually this way, but then yet the atoms point that way. Um, I'm not really gonna explain why, why it does that, it sort of requires a little bit more sophisticated things, but there are such materials. Okay, so um right okay and uh so actually when you uh have this kind of ferromagnetic material what can actually happen is that um even though in a particular region you'll have a ferromagnet but actually you'll have these different regions where the um uh the fields or you know the direction will actually actually point in sort of different directions. So for example, over here, uh, overall, the, um, you know, the direction is sort of like, uh, well, let's, let's say this way, okay? So over here, the overall direction is that way. Over here, the overall direction is that way. And over, over here, the direction is this way. And over here, the direction is this way. Now, if, you know, even though in these regions, and you call these regions domains. So these domains, uh, they're kind of ferromagnets, but you, the larger scale things will actually sort of cancel each other out. So overall, such a thing will actually uh, not have any kind of magnetic property. Whereas if you magnetize a magnet, a ferromagnet, uh, then you'll actually uh, you know, have a situation like this where uh, most of the, atoms are pointing this way and then only a small amount will be pointing the reverse direction. And actually this is basically what you have in a uh, ferromagnetic type of material because uh, sometimes, you know, magnets can lose their magnetism and, um, and basically the, uh, you know, you can, uh, by magnetizing it again, you're basically trying to create more alignment between the domain. Okay. Anyway. Maybe that's a bit more information than you need. Okay. Let's keep going. 
maybe we'll just one more slide. Um, okay, so um, uh, electric uh, currents can also produce uh, magnetism. So what I was trying to explain before with uh, how magnet forms, well, you know, I got to the sort of the point, sort of a chicken and egg problem where you sort of say, okay, where does the magnetism come from? Well, okay, you say, okay, it comes from smaller magnets, but then ultimately you have to sort of say, okay, where does the, where does the actual, you know, uh, why doesn't an atom, one atom have magnetism? Um, ultimately, uh, you have to put it down to the property of the atom. So that's the case for these types of, uh, you know, magnetic materials. But actually, you can also create a magnet even without such, um, uh, you know, like such a, a permanent sort of magnetic material. You can also create it just with a current. So if you if you have a current in a loop like this, then this will actually also create a magnetic field. And in fact, it looks just like um, how um, how a, a regular magnet looks like. Uh, you you know, you have a magnetic field which is going say uh, from uh, north to south like this. So uh, the, the pattern of the magnetic field that it creates is exactly the same. So this uh, is an example of how you can uh, see, sort of visualize the magnetic field. You have a wire here that's uh, carrying a current, just a regular DC current, direct current. And then these iron filings, so there's just uh, sprinkles of iron, an hour of iron powder, this will actually align themselves because they're like little bar magnets, align themselves around the wire. And you can sort of see this pattern of uh, the magnetic field. So um, uh, electric fields, electric currents can actually produce uh, magnetic fields. Okay. Right. And um, if you want to figure out uh, how the electric field is formed. There's this uh, so-called right-hand rule. So um, if you have your finger and you show the direction of the current with your thumb, then if you curl your fingers around like, like this, then the direction of your fingers will actually tell you which way uh, around the current, um, sorry, the magnetic field actually flows. So uh, magnetic field always flows in this kind of circular way. And uh, it, uh, well, yeah, makes that pattern as I showed you there. Now, this is another example with the iron filings. Um, the current is going through this uh, kind of uh, spiral. This is like a notebook spiral. And if you put a current through it, then you can see that actually in the middle here, the magnetic field is going uh, straight up and down the middle. Um, and then so uh, you can work that out because uh, if you put your hand, say the current is flowing, um, suppose it flows sort of uh, this way, then if you put your hand, uh, your thumb along the top here, then the magnetic field will curl around inside. And then what you can work out from that is that the magnetic field actually flows uh, actually down in this way. Okay. This, uh, this uh, wire is actually in front of the in front of the page, so it will curl down and produce a magnetic field. And so, if you if you work this out, and on the other side it actually goes the other way, but still the magnetic field is going down. Okay, I think uh, maybe that's a good place to to break. So, uh, any questions that anybody has so far? No, okay, all right. Then, yeah, so homework for this week, just uh, again, uh, just summarize whatever we did in the lectures, um, hand it in and, oh yeah, uh, I haven't done the bright space thing yet. So I'll do that um, today. So uh, that will be there so you can properly hand it in. But otherwise, um, I will see you next week. Bye everybody. Um, so, Professor, I think uh, for last week's homework, you didn't open the tab for us. To yes, yes, and then yes. That's right. Yeah, sorry I, about that. Yeah, I forgot about that. So, it I'll doesn't do matter. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, thanks. See you. See you.